Uh, chapter 4 is massive. Uh, they took the past two chapters in the last book, so chapter 4 and 5, and put it into just four. Uh, English administration of the colonies, uh, the mercantile system. The mercantile system is this basic fundamental idea that the mother colony would provide, or mother colony, the mother country would provide the colonies with all that they needed, and the colonies would then just sell what they had to the mother country. And clearly it's not uh, a free market or efficient or anything like that. So out of this you get tons and tons of smuggling and inefficiency. Uh, as it talks around there with the Navigation Acts, the idea was is that British ships would sell, would, would ship colonial goods uh, with British sailors to British ports. All of this is true, but uh, some you know, enterprising Scottish guys would oftentimes uh, find ways around this and smuggle the goods to Amsterdam for um, the colonists. So there was oftentimes tons and tons of illicit trading going on outside of the mercantile system. Also realize that the mercantile system couldn't provide everything that the colonists needed. Uh, <clears throat> so they were forced to uh, rely on smuggling or trade with other countries. Great Britain couldn't provide everything that it needed to um, its colonies. I mean, that's just a fact. So if you lived in the Caribbean, you oftentimes traded with pirates because they had the goods you wanted. Now this will change over time, but initially that was they were seen as, as useful uh, to society. Another interesting thing with the Navigation Acts and mercantilism will be the whole enumerated goods list. Um, the enumerated goods list was basically this list of exports that could only be shipped to Britain. Uh, so some of the things on the list included tobacco, cotton, indigo, ginger, sugar, rice, hemp, sailing masts, copper, and furs. Um, all of these could only be shipped to Britain, namely so they could tax them before they got shipped anywhere else because they were highly sought after goods. Now it's interesting that tobacco is on there because James II will make it his like lifelong mission to uh, drive tobacco out because he sees it as a bad habit. Um, so that yet again will lead to more smuggling, much like think, prohibition in uh, in the United States. It's you know they tax tobacco and cigarettes and all that sort of stuff, and what happens? People then smuggle it in for a slightly cheaper price. So it won't work too well, but that will be something that keeps the trade of tobacco very very high. Uh, in the picture here, you can see uh, British warships off the coast of Boston. Uh, the way, one of the ways you can tell that it's Boston and the New World are all the church spires with the lovely greenery behind them. Uh, the warships are supposed to basically show the importance of trade with the New World. English administration continued here. The Lords of Trade. Uh, these basically were a board, much like we referred to earlier, or we'll refer to, maybe it's in the textbook, maybe it's not, it's called a, a Privy Council. The Privy Council was basically a taxing council for trade that reported to the Prime Minister. And the Lords of Trade were basically the, you know, House of Lords version of this. Uh, as it says right here, it was created by Charles in an effort to force the colonies to aid the mercantile standard. Because most of the colonies saw it as frivolous and didn't want to do it. So with the help of warships, they actually forced this. Now, with the death of Charles II and his brother, James II, coming to power, James II will uh, want to kind of put New England in its place. And what they're going to do then is create the dominion of New England. And this is going to undermine Puritanism all over the place. They're going to set New England now as a a royal colony governed by Edmund Andros, who's going to be a very hated figure. And as soon as, soon as the revolution takes place, they grab him and throw him under house arrest. Um, but what will happen here is uh, the, <clears throat> the English 
under Andros will basically start to undermine everything that had been happening. Uh, and as we'll see when we take it to colonial governors in a second, the idea was is that the you know the king had never uh, vetoed anything from Parliament, so it was kind of funny that these colonial governors were always vetoing stuff. And so Andros becomes a very heavy-handed uh, governor and even upsets uh, religious traditions in New England by establishing an Anglican church in a former Puritan sanctuary, or Puritan church. The Glorious Revolution, which we've already talked about, uh, the bringing of William and Mary to the throne. You know, the idea there was James II didn't work out very well because he was uh, kind of too over the top, a little too Catholic. And this brings them bringing William and Mary from Holland uh, to sit on the throne. Now, William and Mary bring with them their war with France, which we'll see here in a couple slides. So the power of the royal governor, as I was pointing out, um, each colony's governmental system evolved differently, as it points out there. These governors, though, basically were in charge, and they oftentimes meddled a little bit much with what happened. Now, under the time of the you know Glorious Revolution, all that sort of stuff, you had the salutary neglect of being left alone for a little bit. Now, in being left alone for a little bit, they each each colony sort of created its own governing system. The House of Burgesses in Virginia, you know, you had your representation in Maryland and so forth and so on. Uh, and so they kind of started to pass their own stuff, as it says right down there at the bottom. Uh, the co co uh, colonial assemblies, the lawmaking branch of the government, were elected by a popular vote of the citizens. Now, clearly, this didn't mean every citizen. Uh, it was men, landowners, um, Indians, uh, women, African Americans or blacks uh, were excluded from the, the political process. But uh, there was, you know, a moniker there of democracy. King William's War will take us into the idea of these colonial wars. These colonial wars oftentimes were, uh, you know, Protestant countries versus Catholic countries. Um, <clears throat> and it'll lead us into what we refer to as the Seven Years' War. Uh, William, as I said there, became king, and he brought with him the coronation of England's involvement in European wars. He basically wanted to go after these Catholic countries. <clears throat> it says three of these were but sideshows in America with little involvement in the colonies. The fourth, as we'll see, is the, the French and Indian War, or referred to in the rest of the world as the Seven Years' War. And the Seven Years' War will actually be a world war and take place all over uh, these colonial holdings. So it'll happen in India, uh, the Caribbean, North America, Europe. So it's kind of really the first world war as it's kind of considered. Now, uh, of course, American history class, they love to bring up this concept of George Washington as soon as they can. George Washington, being a Virginia militiaman, will be sent with troops to Fort Duquesne, and he will be, uh, I believe, defeated and he's sent, ba sent back, and it's kind of the sort of quintessential tale, and we'll talk about it more in class, but um, it, it always is brought up in these American history deals, even though it's kind of a small, small thing, but it's the mythology of George Washington here that gets brought up. The interesting thing here, though, is uh, this famous poster here by Ben Franklin about join or die is about the Albany Congress, about trying to get all the colonies together in aid to fight against the... French and the Indians. And so we see the, the snake here uh, now today is popularized probably by Nike's uh, United States Men's National Soccer Team campaign uh, about don't tread on me with the snake. Uh, but this is the image that it comes from. And the idea here is uh, that all of these colonies need to join together or they'll die. It's clearly pretty obvious by the, the slogan at the bottom. And for the most part, it kind of works. It brings us to this Albany plan. Oh, oh yeah, Albany Congress up there. Uh, as it says, the plan of union, which Franklin you know, popularizes, really doesn't have much come out of it, uh, except it starts to lay the groundwork, groundwork, as we'll see, for the original Articles of Confederation, which is really the first government of the United States. Braddock's defeat... Um, What's going to happen here is there's going to be an overwhelming number of British soldiers that come over to North America that are going to help uh, fight the war against the French and the Indians. Now, the problem is 
initially this is fine for all the Americans or the colonists or however we want to look at them, but in the end it ends up setting a standard which will not be acceptable for the colonists following the war because the soldiers that are left are going to sort of be left to enforce British policies which are going to be unpopular because of this era of salutary neglect, as I pointed out, where they had kind of run their own show. We'll talk about the Battle of Quebec in class, um, and we'll talk about the French and Indian War in, in, a, in total in class, so don't mind this. There's King George uh, when he was roughly 33, so about a year younger than I am, or my current age, and my birthday's next month. But <clears throat> he was the king of England. His victorious empire had defeated the French. And they're about to sign the Treaty of Paris, as we'll see here in a couple slides. But it's interesting, if you see here, this is North America in 1713. The French uh, have a big chunk of land there in the middle of it all. You have the Hudson Bay Company, set, by, set up by Hudson, who had sailed into Hudson Bay, hoping that it was the Great Northwest Passage that would lead him through. And uh, his guys actually freeze to death, trying to sit out the winter in their boat, uh, which isn't very, very good. But uh, also you there have the English colonies that you're used to across the eastern seaboard, New Spain there, so forth and so on. Now following the Treaty of Paris, it looks like this. Uh, the French no longer hold on to their um, North American territories. Uh, Florida becomes English. The eastern half, or excuse me, western half of the French holdings becomes English. The Mississippi River is still the dividing line. Everything then becomes Spanish. It really doesn't matter that it becomes Spanish because the French still are the dominant culture in that area. And it won't be till we have Napoleon and, and the whole changing of people there that that becomes French again. Peace of Paris in 1763. All right, uh, Britain takes France's North American provinces, as it points out right there. Uh, one of the funny things here is the het... Uh, Supposedly, Ben Franklin was trying to discuss the English uh, giving up Canada uh, for these sugar islands, and most people think that it was sort of a ploy um, to trick the French or something like that so that they could get the sugar islands, and he made Canada sound super nice or whatever. Uh, well, it, it's kind of a funny story. I'll try to bring it up in class. The problem here with this new empire, as it says, uh, brings in the time of, of salutary neglect. Salutary neglect is great because they kind of start to do their own thing. But as I pointed out, the problem was that the, the new amount of soldiers are going to cause problems with the colonists. Also, this new land is going to cause problems with the English and the colonists because the English are going to begin to flood into this new Indian land. And the Indians, namely the Ottawa Indians, are going to be pissed because their idea was the French never tried to take our land. They didn't own our land. So the fact that you defeated the French doesn't mean you get our land. So <clears throat> they have a series of strikes, which actually killed thousands of people in 17, I think it's like 1762 or something like that, um, which causes the British to Pro make the proclamation of 1763, which draws a line through the Appalachian Mountains saying, hey, you guys can't go over the Appalachian Mountains. The funny thing is that this doesn't stop anybody, and so they start to push into uh, this area, the Cumberland Gap into Kentucky and stuff like that starts to be the, the norm. So we now see this uh, butting of heads between the British and the colonists over land management, namely Indian land. And so the British are trying to deal with the colonists, but the colonists don't see the Indians in the same light because they'll, they've been massacring people or rebelling against people, however we want to look at it, uh, due to encroachment upon lands. So they see it as sort of their right as, you know, colonists or Englishmen or however we want to look at it to, to move into this land while the British crown is saying, no, 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 wait behind this line. All right, so we'll stop here, and I'll actually show you the video about the colonies turning to states, which is from the uh, author of the book.
History is filled with irony. One of the most uh, ironic developments of American history involved the incredible victory that the British and Americans experienced in 1763 in their war against France. That victory transferred a massive amount of territory in North America from France to England. Great Britain was on top of the world, literally. And the American colonists shared in that excitement because they had also shared in the, in the combat. Americans had volunteered to fight alongside British soldiers against the French in the American uh, wilderness, the American frontier. And yet, only 20 years later, the United States would be formed as a result of the American Revolution. And ironically, one reason for the American Revolution was the frustration of American colonists with the results of the, uh, the British victory in 1763. Great Britain emerged from that prolonged war with the French with massive debts. And the English government decided that the American colonies should pay a percentage of those debts, that the English people should not have to bear the burden of paying off a war that was in part intended to defend the American colonies from the French. So beginning in the 1760s, the English government began a series of actions that required Americans, both directly and indirectly, to pay for the expenses of that war. Those efforts led to resentment and resistance and rebellion and ultimately led to revolution by the Americans against the British. So in just 20 years, from 1763 to 1783, the British went from celebrating the greatest victory in their history to lamenting the loss of their most important colonies, the Americans.